we will be going over injection techniques, maxillary and mandibular injection techniques. The maxillary techniques we're going to cover today are supraperiosteal infiltration, the PSA or posterior superior alveolar nerve block for the maxillary molars, excluding the mesial buccal root of the first molar, the MSA or middle superior alveolar injection, which is the premolars and the mesial buccal root of the molars, and then our ASA injection, which is our anterior superior alveolar, which is our canine lateral and central, um, one on each side nerve block, and then our greater palatine and our nasal palatine, which are our posterior hard palate and our anterior hard palate nerve block injections. Mandibular techniques we're going to talk about are the inferior alveolar nerve block, the buccal or long buccal nerve block that just does posterior molar gingiva, and then lingual nerve infiltration, the mental nerve block, and the incisive nerve block. First, we got to talk about the different types of injections, and they differ on the type and depth of penetration. So you can see the top one, the topical, that is a surface anesthesia. The topical is applied to the surface to block free nerve endings supplying the mucosal surface. So that's only going to work for about two to three millimeters of the initial two to three millimeters of the tissue in that area. Then we've got um, our nerve block at the very opposite end. So our nerve block is injection of local anesthesia in the vicinity of a major nerve trunk to anesthetize the nerve's area of innervation. So usually the injection is a distance from the treatment area. So an example of this might be our inferior alveolar where we're injecting in the back near the mandibular foramen near the lingula and we're expecting that injection, that anesthesia to go to the midline. The PSA, where we're injecting the soft depression um, behind the maxillary tuberosity at the height of the mucobuccal fold, we are going to inject there and then expect that our molars are going to be numbed from that. Our IO, our infraorbital, where we're injecting following the first premolar height of the mucobuccal fold, half of the long needle, and we are going to be expecting our ASA and our MSA, so our midline central incisor to our mesial buccal root of our first molar. We're gonna expect that to be numb, but we're injecting up in the infraorbital area, or even the incisive. We're injecting here at the area of the mental, rub it in and it becomes the incisive, and then we're expecting it to go to the midline on the mandibular anterior. That would be our nerve blocks. Our field block is going to be a form of regional anesthesia deposited near larger terminal nerve branches. It can also be known as the supraperiosteal, which that would be referring to a single tooth in the maxillary. The ASA and MSA are included in that. So even though they numb a couple of teeth, um, those are included in this field block or the supraperiosteal type injection because they are, we're going to be injecting at the height of the mucobuccal fold, second premolar. The apex of the second premolar is our site of deposition. And if a dentist was going in there and had to do a filling, on number four or number 13, he would inject in that same spot as we would for the MSA, which would get the mesial buccal root of the first molar, the second premolar, and the first premolar. And then for the ASA, if a dentist was doing an injection or for the canine to do a filling on the canine, say, they would also get numb all the way to the midline, central incisor, lateral incisor, and the canine. So they're giving it in the same place that you would for a single tooth in the maxillary. It just happens that there's a nerve branch there that, that um, goes to more than just that one tooth for the ASA and the MSA. And then we've got our inter infiltration, local infiltration, soft tissue anesthesia in a limited area deposited closer to smaller terminal nerve endings. And this is good for bleeding control and typically anesthetic with vasoconstrictor is used in an area where um, 
and you can see that it's the second one in penetration, um, that would be more towards the surface area to control bleeding. Or if somebody maybe was, um, I give this infiltration a lot near the midline because there's some crossover. And if they're still feeling something in between 24 or 25, it could be because there's a little crossover from the other side. So I'll sometimes infiltrate into that tissue directly in that area. For injections, we want to obtain informed consent. We have a consent form in the computer. Um, in the consent area, we have the KCC consent to treatment. And in that area, there's also a local anesthetic consent to treatment. There is one in Burmese, so different language. We want someone to know what they're consenting to and know what um, we're gonna be doing. So we have an informed consent that they will sign we're going to prepare our armamentarium. So we're gonna get our syringe, we're gonna get our needle, we're gonna get our cartridge, we're gonna get our needle capping card, we're going to get our topical, we're going to get our cotton tipped applicators that we need um, for possibly pressure anesthesia or for just checking on our pathway into where we're injecting. We're gonna position our patient. Mm -hmm. We're going to locate and palpate anatomical landmarks because every patient is different. We're not just going to assume that because we're doing a mental injection or incisive because we're going to rub it in, we're not just going to assume it's between the first and second premolar on the mandibular. We're going to feel from the molar, palpate all the way to the canine and feel where it is at on each individual patient. We want to keep all of our armamentarium out of sight. Some patients, if they see the syringe, if they see the needle, they get um, very fearful and, and anxious. We want to keep that out of sight for them. We want to tell them what we're going to be doing. We don't want to surprise them. We don't want to um, you know, come from behind where they don't know what we're doing. We want to dry the tissue. Wipe topical wipe, WTW, wipe to dry, place the topical, wipe to get any excess topical out of the way. We're not going to use an over um, amount of topical. We're going to use a small amount and we're going to be precise with our location because we don't want any sloughing or any epithelial desquamination in that area. We're going to have a fulcrum. We're going to have a hand dress. We're gonna pull the tissue tight. We're gonna pull it straight out, just like we've showed you, um, or will be showing you for these different areas. We're gonna pull the tissue tight. If you were going to pop a balloon, it's a lot easier to pop a balloon if it's tight versus if the balloon is deflated. We're gonna hold the syringe palm up so that we can get a fulcrum. If your palm's down, then how are you gonna fulcrum with these, um, you know, your ring finger and your pinky finger? If your palm is up, then you're gonna be closer to the patient's face, so palm up. And then the window with the cartridge is going to be facing towards you so that you can see how much solution has been deposited, how much of the anesthetic solution, and you're going to be able to look to see if you have a positive or negative aspiration on injection or before injection. Communicate. You're going to say, you know, you're, you're going to try to stay away from words, you know, oh, you're going to feel a little poke, you know, okay. Um, you want to communicate, insert needle into the mucosa, advance slowly as you go towards the target. You're going to aspirate, and then you're going to inject slowly. If you were doing the IA, it should take you about a minute to do that full injection. It shouldn't, you know, if you've seen dentists do it before, they typically go pretty fast. Um, but they're doing one patient after another after another, and sometimes they're in a hurry. We are going to do it slow. We're going to be steady. We are going to um, not advance the needle as we're injecting. We're not going to pull it out as we're aspirating. We're going to try to keep that needle steady, still have a good fulcrum and inject slowly and communicate. You're doing a great job. Just a, just a few seconds more. You're doing great. Keep it up. And then you're going to remove the needle slowly. 
you're not going to leave the patient. You're going to maybe write some notes. You're going to, you know, wait just a couple minutes for them to get numb, but you're not going to leave them unattended. You're going to document your use of the local anesthesia. It's great when you have a digital program like we do, because you just click the boxes. You know, did we use lidocaine? Did we use mepivacaine? Did we um, do the right side? Did we do the left side? Did we do which injections? Was there any complications? And you just check box down. What was their pre-op blood pressure? What was their post-op blood pressure? And then it formulates it into a note for you. If you don't have a program like that, you're going to have to do all of that yourself. You're going to record the type of anesthetic that you used. If it was lidocaine, if it was 1 to 100,000, your concentration um, with epinephrine, if there was any vasoconstrictor used, how much was used? Did you give a half a carpeal? Did you give two thirds? Did you give one full carpeal? Did you give one and a half? Um, which injections did you give? And how did the patient do? Patient was numb and comfortable. I, I will write a lot. And then their post-op blood pressure. Um, I know a lot of people ask about blood pressures in the office. And, you know, I make up the excuse that if I had a blood pressure cuff right there, I would do a blood pressure on every patient. I always, always, always do a blood pressure on anybody that I'm going to give an injection to. I do a pre-op and I do a post-op blood pressure. And here would be the example, 1.8 cc's or one carpule of 2% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine, right IA and buckle, so inferior alveolar and buckle, without incident. Patient numb and comfortable, like I just said. Blood pressure, um, post-op, pre-op. So this would be the bare minimum that's listed here. You want to talk to the patient about pain control methods in general. Talk to them about aura kicks. Talk to them about local anesthetic. Talk to them about how much better it could be for you and for them if they're not worrying about feeling something. Um, you want to be empathetic with them. You want to tell them maybe a personal experience. If you've had a good personal experience, you want to be very reassuring to them. Um, some patients are fine. Just do the injection and that's it. Other patients really need that extra reassurance. You'll try to make it as easy and comfortable as possible. You're not going to tell them that you're giving them a shot. You're not going to tell them that, you know, I've heard somebody say, oh, it's like a little bee sting in your mouth. I don't want to be a sting anywhere, let alone in my mouth. Um, you want to tell them they're doing great. You're okay. You're doing fine. You're doing great. Just a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds. You're doing great. Very, very reassuring. With the superperiosteal injection, you're providing anesthesia to a smaller area. So it's the injection site. This is maxillary injections. It's at the height of the mucobuccal fold of the tooth to be anesthetized, and it's directed towards the apex of that tooth. You're going to penetrate the tissue with the bevel towards bone. You're going to advance towards the apex three to five millimeters in most of these areas and then aspirate. You're going to inject slowly. Um, the superperiosteal, like I said, would be an individual tooth, except when you're in the area of the second premolar, and that would be the MSA injection. Remember, 28% of the patient population does not have or of the population in general does not have the MSA, but you don't know who has it, who doesn't. So we're assuming that everybody does. And then the ASA would be when we are injecting at the site of the canine. So three to five millimeters at the height of the mucobuccal fold, um, parallel to the long axis of the canine, and maybe just mesial to that canine eminence directed towards the apex of that tooth. Penetrating the tissue with the bevel towards bone. Like I said before, if it was the dentist doing a filling on the canine and they would be numbing the canine, for us, we're numbing the ASA area because that site of injection is at the same spot. And here's just a picture of a superperiosteal where you enter at the height of the mucobuccal fold and then you proceed to the apex, um, near the apex, which is the site of deposition. Our posterior superior alveolar nerve block, our PSA. Um, you guys have some great references on page 38 for your maxillary. 
injections, and this is in the handbook or the workbook that we use, page 38, and then page 63 for your mandibular. And it's kind of ha has it listed out as a reference guide. Put it in a plastic sleeve, bring that to clinic with you, study that. The questions that we have on our quizzes, on our tests, and on our oral examination, when we do our oral practical, those questions will be asked from these sheets, page 38, maxillary, 63, mandibular. So for our PSA, our landmarks are the maxillary tuberosity, the soft depression at the height of the mucobuccal fold, distal to that last molar. The injection site is distal to the second molar or the last area at the height of the mucobuccal fold. We're using a short needle, our depth of penetration is about half of that short needle, 16 to 20 millimeters, in an upward, inward, backwards direction. And this is where I told you that we're going at a 45 degree to our mid-sagittal plane and a 45 degree to our occlusal plane. We're going to aspirate three times. We are particularly concerned about the pterygoid plexus in this area. So it's very, very important to aspirate three times and be at that correct 45 degree angle to the mid-sagittal 45 degree to the occlusal plane. And then we're gonna inject slowly. And here's our PSA. And remember on the skulls in the classroom, there's that little pencil dot behind where the um, last molar is. That's approximately where your PSA um, foramen is located. This PSA injection will be getting the maxillary molars except for the mesial buccal root of the first molar. That will be anesthetized with the MSA or the middle superior alveolar injection. So middle superior alveolar, MSA, our landmark is going to be our mucobuccal fold at the height of the mucobuccal fold above the second premolar. You're going to have to watch for the frenum in this area. A lot of the time the frenum will be right in your way. You have to decide if you're going to go in front of it or behind it. Typically behind it, but depending on the location. This is going to be important to pull the tissue straight out very tight so that your frenum isn't in the way. The injection site is at the height of that mucobuccal fold above the second premolar. You are going to go in about five millimeters, three to five millimeters. And it says here bone is gently contacted, so just a few millimeters. Ugh. I don't know that I agree that bone is gently contacted. If you are moving in slowly and you contact bone, you may have to move out into the vestibule a little bit because remember just the curve of that um, maxilla in that area is such that you could hit bone. You're gonna aspirate, inject slowly, your bone, your bubble's gonna be towards the bone so that the solution is going towards the middle superior alveolar nerve. And then you are going to have the premolars and the mesial buccal root of the first molar. Teeth are going to be numb and the facial and interproximal gingiva are going to be numb. So here we are, middle superior. You're gonna be pretty parallel to that second premolar. And when you go in at the height of the mucobuccal fold, you're gonna go three to five millimeters and your deposition site is going to be at the apex area of that second premolar. In your ASA, your landmarks here are your canine eminence, the mucobuccal, mucolabial fold, and the apex of the canine. The injection site is at the height of that mucobuccal fold. It's anterior to the canine eminence, so a little bit to the mesial of the canine eminence, and it's parallel. You're going parallel to the long axis of the tooth. You're going to advance the needle towards the apex of the canine at a 45 degree angle because your maxilla naturally kind of curves in that area. You're going to go closer to three millimeters, but three to five millimeters, and you're going, going to aspirate and deposit the anesthetic. In this one, you kind of have to be ready for the patient to move. This one can be a little touchy. It's gonna feel like their nose gets numb, but you're gonna be at the apex of the canine slightly mesial to that canine eminence. This is going to numb canine lateral central. If you were doing canine to canine, you would have two injections. 
ASA on the right, ASA on the left. Tissue's going to be very taut to keep that cheek tight and out of the way. Your greater palatine foramen. This is the junction of the vertical and horizontal plate of the palate. Your alveolar bone and your palatal bone come together right around that greater palatine foramen. And the injection site is going to be just anterior, so just towards the front of the mouth um, at the greater palatine foramen. You are going to use pressure anesthesia for this injection. Distal to the first molar, you are going to advance and you're going to be right anterior to that greater palatine foramen. Pressure is going to be applied for one minute prior to the injection. And then you are going to be numbing the posterior palatal gingiva only from premolar to molars, no teeth. Here we are, greater palatine foramen. And there's your pressure anesthesia with the cotton-tipped applicator. You're going to go just anterior to that. Nasopalatine. We've got the nasopalatine nerve coming through the incisive foramen underneath the incisive papilla. You are going to inject at the fattest part of that incisive papilla. You're going to apply pressure with the cotton swab for one minute prior to the injection. Wipe topical wipe, pressure anesthesia for one minute, and then you're going to do your injection. Um, the needle is going to be just to the side of the cotton tipped applicator, not directly into it, and you're going to hold the pressure while you're slowly injecting. You are not going to be able to get into the area very far with the greater palatine or with the nasopalatine. Um, sometimes just covering the bevel and maybe two millimeters. It says two to three, but maybe two millimeters. And then it says that you're going to inject a quarter of a carpule. No way. <laughs> maybe an eighth of a carpule. Um, but officially, you're going to tell us a quarter of a carpule. You'll watch the tissue blanch. When I say blanching, it, there's a whiteness to it that will kind of spread. The tissue is pretty keratinized, so it's hard to inject. You're going to feel like you're putting a ton of pressure on there. The area is going to blanch, turn white as the fluid enters right there in the fattest part of the incisive papilla. And it's going to numb the anterior palatal gingiva from canine to canine. One injection, all of the anterior palatal gingiva. Huh. Okay, maxillary injections. All righty. Thank you for your attention. Good job, guys.